Ethiopia is expected to start filling the reservoir of a massive dam it is constructing on the Nile River with or without an agreement with Egypt and Sudan. Last June, an enraged Egypt took the matter to the UN Security Council, saying Ethiopia's dam construction on the Nile will have great consequences for Egypt. The matter on which I am addressing you today is of the greatest consequence to the Egyptian people and requires like our efforts to combat this global pandemic, a commitment to uphold the spirit of cooperation. In what is a sign of deep-rooted disagreements between the two countries, Ethiopia insisted the council is not the right place to discuss the conflict. Let me be clear that Ethiopia doesn't believe the issue being discussed today has a legitimate place in the Security Council. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Africa Today. I'm your presenter, Mubarak Kenya. And I am Sheila Nelima. In our program, we shall focus on the dispute between Egypt and Ethiopia and Sudan over the construction of a giant hydroelectric dam on the Nile River. On the second part of our program, we shall highlight efforts to boost Africa's agriculture amid the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll also take a look at social media comments and see what you have sent for us. And as usual, we are going to take a look at Africa News. So stay tuned. Nile Dam Dispute Ethiopia has constructed Africa's biggest hydroelectric dam on the Blue Nile. The construction of the dam, officially known as the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, began near the country's border with Sudan back in April 2011. The $4.5 billion project is touted as Africa's biggest hydroelectric power plant and is being constructed on the Nile, which is credited as the longest river in the world. Egypt wants guaranteed access to adequate water if there is a drought while Ethiopia is filling the reservoir. Egypt relies on the Nile for over 90% of its water. Meanwhile, Ethiopia maintains that the dam could ultimately provide for more electricity at a cheaper price and for export. For more on the ongoing dispute over Ethiopia's Grand Renaissance Dam, we have contacted Ashok Swain, a professor of peace and conflict research at the Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University. He is also the UNESCO Chair of International Water Cooperation. Now, thanks a lot, Professor Swain, for your time. Our first question, what is at stake in the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam dispute? The dam, uh, which is uh, a hydropower dam, it's a massive uh, dam, this is the largest dam in Africa, um, built around with the $5 billion uh, money there. So this is the largest uh, infrastructure project. Uh, the thing is that it will able to store the water for the hydropower production. Uh, the good thing is that it will not take the water from the river system, but while storing the water, the uh, downstream countries, particularly Egypt, is concerned that while storing the water in this dam will, uh, will uh, reduce the water supply to Egypt because Egypt is dependent 90 to 95 percent of its water supply comes from the Nile River. So I think this is where Egypt's concern is the storage of water in Ethiopia. But we must know that Ethiopia is not diverting the water from the system through the dam. Professor Ashok Swain, conflict research analyst. Trilateral talks between Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan failed to yield any tangible results. Consequently, Ethiopia declared its intent to fill the dam's reservoir in July without an agreement in place. This prompted Egypt and Sudan to formally request UN Security Council intervention to prevent what they perceive as significant dangers to international peace and security from Ethiopia's move. Addressing the UN Security Council late June, Egyptian Foreign Minister Sami Shukri said his country faces an existential threat from the hydroelectric dam that Ethiopia is building on the Blue Nile River. The matter on which I am addressing you today is of the greatest consequence to the Egyptian people and requires, like our efforts to combat this global pandemic, a commitment to uphold the spirit of cooperation and to recognize that no nation is an island unto itself. Meanwhile, Ethiopia rejected the UN Security Council's intervention in the matter. 
Tai Atske Selassie, Ethiopia's ambassador to the United Nations, pointed out that the Security Council should not be a forum for exerting diplomatic pressure. Let me be clear that Ethiopia doesn't believe the issue being discussed today has a legitimate place in the Security Council. It is bound to set a bad precedent and open a Pandora box. This council should not be a forum for exerting diplomatic pressure. Professor Swain, what are the stumbling blocks in reaching an agreement over the management of the Nile waters? Most of these issues have been addressed. The real problem lies if there is a long-term drought period in the basin, um, because the climate change has made it also quite a problematic that if there is, a, and that area region is also quite uh, prone to have long-term drought seasons. So if that takes place, how to how to share or how Ethiopia will ensure that certain amount of water reaches uh, Egypt? And the second uh, point, which I think is, is the point of contention where not, they are not able to reach any compromise, is that if there is a conflict arises over this uh, agreement, uh, who will, how to find a solution or who will able to adjudicate that conflict? South Africa has called on the United Nations Security Council to respect the African Union and continental efforts led by AU Chairman President Cyril Ramaphosa to find a solution to the Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam dispute between Ethiopia, Sudan and Egypt. The call was made by Ambassador Jerry Majilla, permanent representative of South Africa to the United Nations during the UN Security Council meeting on the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. It is therefore important that the Security Council respect the African Union and our continent efforts and provide space for the parties through the agreed upon mechanism in the last bureau meeting to find a solution that will ensure a peaceful and prosperous future for these three neighborly and sisterly countries in the African continent. can the African Union play in resolving this dispute before it spirals out of control? I think African Union, I find, is the best possible uh, negotiator at this stage, uh, particularly when uh, Egypt took this to Security Council uh, the, in the context of the what is going in the internal politics in the Security Council and also the way China looks at this uh, issue, uh, the upstream, uh, China hugely protective about the upstream rights, uh, upstream countries' rights. So there was no hope from the Security Council for to mediate on, on this issue. Ethiopia has accused the United States of being undiplomatic in its role of facilitating talks between the three countries on the Nile River Dam. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi reportedly requested his ally U.S. President Donald Trump to pressurize Ethiopia to sign an agreement favorable to Egypt. The Ethiopian foreign minister strongly protested the move. The recent statement by the U.S. we believe is undiplomatic and does not reflect a great nation like this. The United States has been accused of favoring Egypt in the ongoing dispute. Is Washington trying to arm twist Ethiopia? Particularly the present regime in the United States, uh, first of all, it, so it, didn't, it really went out of its way to force Ethiopia to sign it the uh, agreement or sign uh, something which... Uh, uh, Ethiopia was not in because you need time. If 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 one party is not signing an agreement, is it has certain issues. You need certain time. But the, uh, the United States forced Ethiopia, which Ethiopia declined. And I think uh, there is uh, there are uh, the U United States failed to act as a negotiator uh, completely in this case because it, it should have been. It was a, it was clearly biased. Thanks for that, Professor Ashuk Swain, and stay tuned for more. A 
According to an agreement during the British colonial era, Egypt and its neighbor Sudan have more rights over the Nile waters. There have been calls for a new framework to manage the Nile waters. John Nia Oro, a consultant on international water law, gives his take on the issue. With a new agreement that will provide rights and obligation all of the riverian states to allow a peaceful and sustainable management and development of the Nile River Basin water resources. A colonial agreement favoring Egypt on the management of the Nile is still in place. Should other Nile Basin countries demand a revocation of the agreement? Egypt uh, is, is uh, talking about it, but I think Ethiopia doesn't even accept it because the kind of thing we are talking about the 1902 agreement between the uh, Italians and the British. Uh, the, the only agreement which uh, operates uh, the basin now, particularly between only Egypt and Sudan, that is 1959 agreement, and both the countries were at that time independent Egypt and Sudan. There is no agreement uh, with Ethiopia uh, over in the, in the Nile Basin in that sense. So I think it's a, it, this is where the real challenge for the Egypt to accept Ethiopia as a legitimate partner. Ethiopia was recently hit by protests that killed over 230 people, demanding justice for a famed musician who was shot dead in Addis Ababa. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmad has said the killing of the popular singer and subsequent violence represented coordinated attempts to destabilize the country. <laughs> As the UN Security Council was meeting to discuss the Renaissance Dam crisis, this assassination crime took place. It's a crime in which an external force has participated and carried it out using a local force. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed asserted that the unrest will not distract plans to fill the dam and noted that if Ethiopia doesn't fill the dam, it means Ethiopia has agreed to demolish the dam. Now, Professor Aswed, Parties to the conflict have clearly taken hardline stances. What should be done to break the deadlock about the Renaissance Dam? They can possibly go for a, a short-term arrangement because uh, this is now the rainy season, the, the waters are falling, the waters are there, uh, the dam is being built. Uh, the, so I think uh, Ethiopia needs to uh, fill the start filling the dam because one unless you start filling the dam you will not able to do the construction step properly. They can possibly opt for a short term agreement for one year agreement and that has been also taken in other uh, river water agreement when you don't really agree for a long term agreement you take short term approach. <laughs> And now in this segment of our program, my colleague will be presenting you news and events from across Africa. Now, what do we have today, Sheila? Thank you, Henia. Today we touch on the east, the west, and the southwest of Africa. Let's start with East Africa. Tanzania has been predicted to register the fastest economic growth in Eastern Africa. The African Development Bank stated in a report that the prediction owes to increased prices of gold during this pandemic period, with Tanzania being a major national exporter. Still on the same country, as expected, the Chama Chama Pinduzi have endorsed President Magufuli to run for a second term in the upcoming presidential polls. The president restated that he would not stand for a third term as suggested by other leaders. Samia Suluhu was nominated as his running mate. Now off to the West, the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora, formerly Libraria Ghana, has been relaunched and renamed. It opened in 2017 by Ghanaian writer Sylvia Arthur. The library holds 4,000 books and is based on Arthur's personal collection. The literature collection features writers from almost all countries in the African continent and the works of black writers from across the world. Now on to tours and travel. Kenya's tourism industry has reopened 
reopened. Park entry fees for all local and international visitors has been slashed down to 50% for a period of one year. The reduced fee also applies to filmmakers who would want to shoot in the country's wild. Now heading southwest, Seashells was globally ranked 38 out of 180 in the Environmental Performance Index 2020. It was the first in Africa and scored high in the protection of biodiversity. The island scored 100% in its work of protecting its marine and terrestrial. Now, to the Embassy of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Kenya has organized an African virtual cartoon festival on COVID-19. The embassy partnered with the University of Nairobi and the East African Cartoonist Society to bring an opportunity open to African nationals and Iranian works. My objective is to uh, send a message of the health workers to the people how to combat with the coronavirus while you know we are facing with fragile health system in Africa so we have to use whatever uh, tools we have at hand to send the messages to the people so to take care of uh, themselves and their families thanks for staying with us Boosting Africa's agriculture. As COVID-19 increasingly affects Africa, the shocks to agriculture and food systems become more evident. Building resilience for the most vulnerable in the continent is now a priority. Many farmers have been negatively impacted by COVID-19 across the African continent, as this poultry farmer in Kenya explains. Even then, after cutting the production to half, we've been forced to sell our chicken at half what we would have sold in any other ordinary day. But even with that half price, we are not able to sell the chicken, to put it into the market. The closure of restaurants and reduced grocery shopping has diminished demand for fresh production, affecting producers and suppliers, especially smallholder farmers. Dr. Charles Murakizi, Director General of Agriculture Development of Rwanda, expounds here on how COVID-19 has affected farmers in the country. Basically, um, uh, the, the sector, of course, is uh, suffering from uh, or has been affected by um, reduced uh, um, demand um, um, for the different commodities. Uh, we've also had exports, uh, cross-border trade. Um, also, there has been uh, reduced uh, demand for these products. Uh, so um, that has been uh, the issue. Experts are saying there is need to think beyond COVID-19 and to focus on innovative measures to modernize African agriculture. For more on this subject, we contacted Dr. Yemi Akinbamijo, the Executive Director of the Forum for Agriculture Research in Africa. Thanks a lot, Dr. Akinbamijo, for granting us this interview. What projects are currently in place to modernize agriculture in Africa and use of technology to boost output and ensure sustainable farming? On the continent itself, the African Development Bank um, under the leadership of Dr. Akimumi Adeshino, set up an initiative that is called TAT, T-A-A-T. -A -A this is Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation. Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation. Now, these are initiatives that are currently ongoing on the continent towards the modernization and the deployment of science using the technologies that have been developed over the years to strengthen the productive capacity of the African agricultural sector. Thanks for that. Stay tuned. To transform agriculture in Africa, there is a need to look at leveraging digital technologies to transform the delivery of inputs, soil testing, crop insurance, credit, and extension of advice and market linkages. 
Some African countries, such as Kenya, have pioneered in offering digital technologies to farmers. Kenya's Safaricom's Digifarm platform has won the 2020 Best Mobile Innovation for Emerging Markets in this year's Global Mobile Awards. The platform provides smallholder farmers with convenient access to a variety of services. What are the challenges in innovation and digitalization of Africa's agriculture? The whole concept of innovation, actually, let me put it this way, it's science, technology, and innovation, within which you have digitalization, is something that FARA has been driving on the continent over the last decade. Meanwhile, as COVID-19 increasingly affects Africa, the shocks to agriculture and food systems become more evident. Building resilience for the most vulnerable is now a priority. Josefa Sako, African Union Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture, expounds here on what the African Union is doing to assist African farmers amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Taking the advantage of the mechanism of newly created uh, African continental free trade area and fifth safeguarding input supply chain for small scale uh, agriculture producers, poultry, livestock and fishery. The African Union is working to build resilience for the most vulnerable. Do we have joint continental agricultural policies and regulations in Africa for such programs to succeed? I would like to say this. I think on the continent, we have enough policies. We have um, the political will. There is what we call the Malabo Declaration. There's what we call the CADEP. There's what we call the STISA, the Science, Technology and Innovation Strategy for Africa. That's what we call the Agenda 2063. We have enough policies on the ground. And I, so I'm not worried about um, looking for new continent-wide initiatives. No, we have enough. And these are strong and robust enough to drive Africa's agriculture. The challenge we have is the wherewithal, the, the, the financial power to put these policies into motion. We are all very optimistic that Africa will soon be able to feed itself and also feed the whole world. In this segment, we are going to be reading our viewers' comments. On the episode highlighting racism in the United States, we had at Financial Bounty Hunters USA saying, who cares? It's just blacks dying. While MSM outlets here in America spend countless hours on issues of racial injustice, perhaps they may want to undertake a real review of the Clinton Foundation, run Baxi Labs of Delhi, India, Harvard, Columbia, a number of charities in cooperation with the World Health Organization, real racism. High time that this corruption gets laid out in court. We also had at Bonzi Fonzi stating, the fight is not over. Keep pushing, keep fighting, keep signing, keep sharing. Black lives matter every day. Hashtag defund the police. We also had Amaya stating, the real reason why racism is so controversial is because white people want to keep their privilege. We also had recoveries stating, black lives matter, whether with media coverage or not. It is literally about life and death daily. We must not forget. We also had at Javed Han stating, if you don't stand against racism and injustice, today it's them, tomorrow it's you. On that note, we come to the end of this edition of Africa Today. Hope you enjoyed the program. Goodbye from me, Mubarak Kenya. And from me, Sheila Nelima, and the entire team.